and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, contribute to this uh, symposium uh, by uh, giving this talk entitled uh, The Covenant Factory in Europea A Treatment Protocol. My name is Cedric Hermans. I'm based in uh, Brussels, uh, Belgium. Please find here uh, a disclaimer from the private company. So this slide summarizes more or less the content of my talk. I will focus mainly on factor eight. As you know, we have different options uh, when uh, we need to uh, treat our patients with hemopia A. First of all, we could use a human plasma. Uh, depending on the place where you live, you could use prior precipitate or uh, concentrate of plasma-derived factor eight. And the issue here is certainly the infectious safety and the risk of immunity development. As you all know, um, during the last uh, decades, uh, factor eight uh, has been uh, <clears throat> produced by biotechnology, and I will review with you uh, how that has been achieved, what were the motivations, and also review with you the different generations of uh, recombinant factor eight that we know have available that have resulted in a major increase in uh, infectious safety. I will also discuss with you to what extent uh, uh, infectious safety has been improved by recombinant factor eight and also address more or less the risk of inhibited development, specifically, specifically when, uh, when switching products. And as you all know, we also have today a new treatment option, which is a non-replacement therapy provided by uh, a bit specific antibody that mimics the actions of factor eight. I will quickly review with you the mode of action uh, the hemostatic effect and discuss with you the efficacy, safety, and modality of use. This uh, slide summarizes, I think, very nicely the major developments in hemophilia treatment since 1920. At that time, only eye splinting bed rest was available, blood transfusions became available in the 30s, 40s, and then plasma uh, became the treatment of choice for patients in the 60s. Uh, in the 60s, in the 50s, 60s, uh, in the 60s, the core precipitate became available that had a, mid, a major impact on the treatment of our patients in Mophia. And then uh, concentrates of factor 8, factor 9 were developed, as well as DGBT. Uh, at that time, uh, we also had to face the dramatic consequences of the contaminations of thousands of patients with Mophia with the HCV and HIV virus. And as a result of this, the safety of plasma drive factor A, factor 9 had to be improved. In the 90s, the recombinant options became available. They were progressively uh, improved. And then more recently, extended house life factor A, factor 9 became available, as well as non replacement therapy and uh, gene therapy. So if you are more interested in all these aspects um, of hemophilia treatment development, I would invite you to read this nice paper by Peter Manucci, published earlier this year. Well, clearly, when you need to select a specific treatment for all patients with hemophilia, well, what should you prioritize? Well, certainly one of the most serious complications is the risk of limited development, and I'm sure this is a, a fear, a, a complication that you fear in, in your patient. The second one is Certainly, the pathogen safety uh, that had to be improved because of what happened in the past. But I, as I will share with you, there is a persistent risk, much more theoretical, of uh, <clears throat> transfusion transmitted infection, uh, even with the most recent products. Clearly, over the last decades, there have been uh, major changes in the manufacturing of plasma products and also the development of recombinant products. And the purpose of all this was to minimize the risk of infection. So that was really the motivation uh, when the manufacturing process were improved. If we consider plasma products, well, clearly what's important, well, where does the plasma come from, the donor selection, the virus screening, and also the detection of infectious agents by nucleic, nucleic acid testing, and also all the techniques that have been implemented to eliminate, eradicate, or inactivate infectious agents. When we consider you no know, recombinant products, well, clearly 
the manufacturing process has been improved by selecting the most appropriate cell line, by eliminate, eliminating as much as possible all kinds of exogenous human or animal proteins, and also at the end of this process to remove and inactivate uh, of, uh, infectious agents. So that was how things were well improved over the last decade. This basic slide shows you the uh, very uh, complex process uh, describing how plasma derived factor eight and factor nine are in fact produced. First of all, you need donors, many donors that have to be carefully um, selected. So they need to fulfill uh, questionnaires and then they will donate plasma or blood. Uh, some of this plasma uh, will not be kept. All of them will undergo extensive uh, testing for viral markers and then there will be an inventory period. And then if all these plasma are saved, mini pool will be created. On this mini pool containing up to 1,000 donations, the lab test will be repeated, and then large pools will be created. Again, the nucleic, nucleic acid testing will be repeated once more to make sure that there is no contamination. And then this will produce the material that will undergo fractionation plus uh, pathogen inactivation and removal. And at the end of this complex process that I will review with you, we will obtain different fractions containing uh, these uh, multiple products that we need to treat our patient, along which patients with hemophilia. The final formulation will again undergo lab testing, and that will help us to produce the final product that will be lyophilized. So this is a very complex process, and this process is needed to produce a uh, concentrate of factor eight and factor nine. It's clear that over the last decade, this process has been improved by sensitive testing for the virus that we know, by the uh, uh, degree of preparation of plasma derived factor concentrate, so very careful donor testing. And these donors have to uh, complete a questionnaire and to provide informed consent. And also, as I just showed you on my previous slide, many, many processes were implemented to inactivate and remove pathogens, including heat treatment, solvent detergent treatment, and nanofiltration. So the good news is that uh, in the last 20 years, no bloodborne transmission of hepatitis viruses or HIV has occurred following the implementation of all these approaches, testing, preparation, and pathogen inactivation. However, you need to know that plasma screening alone does not fully ensure the highest level of safety. Why? Because screening of blood donors and plasma pools may still make contamination from other sources. So you might have uh, <clears throat> infections, but not get seropositive donors. So very difficult to identify. And the, on, the other problem, which is a major problem, is that you can only screen for pathogens that you know. So what about emerging pathogens? And I'll come back to that. You also need to take into account that the, the, the patterns of uh, treatment have changed a lot in our patients, and our patients are um, increasingly uh, treated and exposed to products. So as a result of that, there is an increased risk of exposure. So that uh, the probability that a patient with hemophilia might acquire an infection uh, might be increased since it's clearly affected by the microbial load to which an individual is exposed. And these changing patterns are uh, listed here on this slide, more prophylactic, ITI, longer lifespan of patients, high rate of surgery. Well, all this uh, process will increase the risk of exposure. So clearly, increased use of plasma products leads to exposure to a wider pool of donors. What do we know about transfusion transmission infectious risk with plasma derived products? Well, today the risk of contracting HBV, HIV, and HCV through transfusion and blood products has almost been eliminated in developed countries. However, the last 20 years have seen notable transfusion transmitted infections with plasma derived protein fact concentrate, mainly parvovirus B19, human parvovirus 4, and new variant CJD. So what can I tell you about the recently emerging pathogens? I will first focus on the power of virus B19. Well, you are all familiar with this virus, which is a small, non 
enveloped DNA virus, which is responsible for a benign flu-like illness that mainly occurs in children. This virus is resistant to inactivation and elimination uh, techniques uh, provided by available original process. And the reason for this is that this virus is non enveloped It's clear that a virus that is lipid envelope is much more easily destroyed. And we know that the prevalence of B19 parvovirus is approximately 1% among blood donors. Nucleic, nucleic acid test screening may not be completely effective in preventing transmission of parvovirus B19. Today, the parvovirus has not been proven to cause significant chronic illness in immunocompetent patients. And but recent studies have shown that this parvovirus B19, as well as another one, parvovirus 4, can be transmitted via blood donation and plasma products. So this information tells us that some viruses can still survive current plasma purification and inactivation. So this is a little bit concerning. It's not a major issue with parvovirus B19, but what could be the consequences if you have to deal with an infectious agent that could be responsible for major illness. So this is an issue. Another one, and this is clearly illustrated today by the COVID-19 pandemic, this is the emergence of new human pathogens. So how can we summarize the process in place here? Well, clearly, clearly we, uh, in our world, we are every day confronted with multiple zoonotic pools that contain plenty of infectious agents. These are mosquitoes, ticks, sandflies, bites, food, bats, and you can see on my slide all the infectious agents here that are present in all these pools. Well, there is a risk that many of these infectious agents could uh, be uh, introduced in the human population, and once in the human population, they could even spread uh, between humans. And this what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic. This is what happened with other infectious agents in the past. So what's a little bit concerning here is what could happen to us in the future if new emerging pathogens would appear. And a, a good example is the very interesting Jacob disease, which was an emerging pathogen. So as you know, it's responsible for transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. I will not go into the details, but we know how difficult it is to screen blood and blood products for new variants in GD. Uh, methods are currently being developed, but they are not that widely available. So we know what are the consequences of this disease. And I would like to remind you that a significant proportion of patients with hemophilia in the past have been, have been exposed to that infection. Agents. And that was certainly the case uh, in, in the UK, where uh, a few donors were identified infected with uh, new variant CJD. They contributed to plasma and blood donation, and these donations were used to produce factor eight, factor nine, so you can see 24 batches. And then there is good evidence that hundreds of patients have been found to receive this uh, implicated batches. And this is probably an underestimation. So you can see here on this slide, and without going into the details, how broadly an infection can spread among humans, specific, and more specifically among patients with hemophilia, certainly when they are massively exposed to products. And that was certainly a problem in the UK, but that was also a problem in many other countries outside the UK, because we know to what extent this product, this plasma product can be distributed in many countries. So, and this is also what happened with this COVID-19 pandemic. Although it started in China, you can you know see the global consequence. And it was exactly the same when uh, with HIV. So clearly with HIV, very quickly this virus spread in the community. And uh, in fact, when the testing became available uh, to detect this HIV, well, by that time, 63% of the patients with hemophilia in the U.S. had been infected with HIV. And uh, similar scenarios have been found with other infectious agents. And if story is repeating itself, 
uh, witnessing what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. And you should not all underestimate the major exposure of our patients in Ophelia to uh, uh, plasma drive PAX9 and PAX8, the potential number of donors. I will not go into the details here, but if you consider the case of some patients with severe hemophilia who are treated very regularly with prophylaxis, and they, they use plasma drive PAX8, PAX9, well, considering that uh, these patients will use PAX8, PAX9 from different batches that have been obtained from thousands of uh, different donors, you can easily estimate that these patients with hemophilia might have been exposed over their lifetime to even millions of potential donors. So, and uh, all these people might not all be friends, some of, of them might have been contaminated. So clearly that could uh, be responsible for contamination of our community and that happened in the past. And no surprise that in uh, many countries that uh, pay a lot uh, to infections in the past, such as the UK, the recommendation is strong uh, for uh, recombinant factory in fact, nine concentrate. It's also the same in Italy for children and also in the Nordic countries. So, and in my country too, Belgium, where well, clearly the recommendation is to use as much uh, recombinant factory in fact, nine as possible. And this brings me to the production of recombinant factory in fact, nine. And that represented a major achievement in the development of new therapeutic options for all patients with, uh, with hemophilia. So how is this possible? So how can you produce factory and factory 9 by biotechnology? Well, first of all, you need cells that will do the job. So these are uh, most, of the, most of the time mammalian cells, although it's also possible you know, to use uh, human stem line. These are the CHO, the Chinese hamster ovary cells, the DHK cells, the baby hamster kidney cells, and the EHK or human embryonic kidney cells. So what you need to do is to introduce in this cell the critical information that will be needed to, to guide, to inform the cells how to produce factory and factory 9. So you, you need to introduce the, the, the DNA uh, coding for factory and factory 9 in these cells. And then once these cells have been transfected, they will be able to produce using their own machinery, uh, factory and factory 9 that will, that will be produced completely uh, uh, synthetically. So this is what happens at the cell level, but clearly this process uh, has uh, to be uh, in, has to be industrialized. So that means uh, become part of a manufacturing process, and this is what that's uh, taking place in these big factories where factory eight, factory nine are produced by biotechnology. So all the cells like the cells I just showed you, uh, will, uh, uh, will be put in a big fermenter, uh, and there uh, these cells will, will keep growing. Uh, it's clear that you need to give these cells the uh, specific food medium that they need, and then these cells will work, work, multiply, produce factory, factory 9, that you will have to purify using different techniques, ultrafiltration, purification, and then that will help you to produce factory factory So this process here is very similar to what I showed you for uh, plasma drive factory in factory Although uh, there are different factory in factory available on the market, you should know that all of them show some differences. I don't have much time to go into the details, but clearly the cells that are used to produce this recombinant factory factory concentrate, the sequence that is transfected the cell culture, the purification process, and the final formulation might show differences. So clearly, you cannot consider that all these recombinant factory factor nine concentrate are exactly the same. Even when produced by biotechnology, they all have their specificity. And what you need to know about this manufacturing process of recombinant factory factor nine, well, clearly the purification is still important because you need to produce pure factor A which does not contain potential contaminants, ingredients that were present in the manufacturing process. And also, you need to remove potential uh, infectious agents, viruses, or other agents that might have contaminated 
the manufacturing process, although this is very unlikely. And this slide shows you the multiple steps that are used to obtain safe profit. And there are many steps. Why? Because each step has the potential to reduce the concentration of one specific or multiple infectious agents that are listed here on my slide. So for those of you who have some expertise in the biochemistry and in purification process, you can see here multiple uh, types of purification process that will reduce the concentration of each of these infectious agents. And you can easily imagine that if you use all these sequence, all these steps sequentially, that will result in the production of uh, of uh, factor eight, factor nine concentrate that is really pure and totally devoid of infectious agents. So let's now apply this to products that you know, to factor eight, to factor nine. So you know that factor eight is a complex protein and it makes sense uh, very uh, rapidly to produce recombinant factor eight without the B domain. We know that the B domain is not instrumental for the, well, the cropping properties. So if you delete the B domain, B domain, it will not impact on the hemostatic efficiency. And you need to know that the most advanced cropping factors available today are produced without the B domain. And if you know, uh, focus on the specific manufacturing process of Moroxococ alpha, Sinta, uh, Refacto, you can see that this is a very safe process. It does not contain albumin, so there is no addition of human or animal protein. Uh, there is a synthetic ligand to bind to a recombinant factor eight when it has been produced, so you don't need monoclonal antibodies purified from mouth. And at the end of the process, there is an filtration step that will, uh, will retain uh, potential viral particles that will still be present. So you can see here the complexity of the process. So on top of the production bio, by biotechnology uh, that does not require plasma and blood donors, so you have to start to produce this factory. The factory that has been produced will then be purified by adding this multiple purification step uh, resulting in an end product that is completely safe. And over the last uh, two decades, major advances have been achieved uh, in, in the production of this recombinant product. Initially, this recombinant factor eight, factor nine were produced using uh, human or animal proteins that had to be added. And then it was possible to remove them. And now with the latest products, third generation, we don't need this uh, animal or human protein. And with a product like uh, Roxococ, Sinta uh, Refacto, which also contains a uh, nanofiltration uh, step at the end and which use uh, synthetic ligands to bind to factor eight, well, these are processes which make the product even safer. The same scenario does apply to uh, benefits, non, uh, Nonacoc Alpha, which is a recombinant factor nine, well, I will not go into the details, but this is more or less the same process. So you produce factor nine by uh, a, a cell line that will help you to produce factor nine, which will then undergo multiple purification steps, and that will help you to obtain factor nine that is completely free of any kind of contaminant. And this slide shows you again the multiple steps that were added to the to the manufacturing process to make the end product safe. So clearly. I try to convince you that recombinant products represent a major step forward, that they are not exactly the same, that you can use different uh, stone lines with different processes. I also have tried to convince you that the recombinant concentrate totally eliminates the, the use of human or animal proteins today, not only in the manufacturing process, but also in the final formulation. And that does improve the safety of our products. So the questions you might you may ask me is how do you switch between these different products? Is there any rationale? What are the modalities? What are the risks? Well, clearly, why should you go for recommended products? Certainly the safety, the efficacy, the good supply, the convenience, and also the sustainability and the investment that will be made in companies that develop treatment for the future of hemophilia. So here are a potential reason for switching again, safety, certainly infection safety, cost, 
might even be better compared to other products, convenience of use, validation, and also the diversity of concentrate that we use. In my center, we try to use different concentrate to avoid monopoly scenario that we do in the flight. What would be the, the reasons for not switching if there is a major difference in cost? Although that has to be carefully appreciated, the fear, the risk of inhibited development, the patient's conservatism, the logistic difficulties and the limited availability. Certainly, when you switch a patient from a plasma product or a common product, you need to take into account the patient's profile. Is it a pub a minimally treated, a previously treated, the age, the environment, the previous treatment, and also the personal family history of inhibitor development? So you need to more or less profile your patient. And these are the different uh, switching scenarios from plasma to recombinant, from recombinant to recombinant, from recombinant full length to recombinant deep domain factor eight and from short acting to long acting. And clearly I could add other lines to my table because there are multiple scenarios here. This is an important slide summarizing what you should do when switching. Clearly you should carefully appreciate the risk of inhibitor development, which is very small in PCP. There should, that should, there should be an appropriate medical follow-up. So you should uh, make sure that you screen for the inhibitor before and after switch, obtain reimbursement, avoid waste of concentrate, education and information about the product of the new, of the patient when he switched. And also, I think the timing of switch is important. Do not do that at time of surgery, trauma, or before 50 exposure days in start. And this slide summarizes what I've already told you, what are the key determinants when switching from uh, <clears throat> Uh, switching factory concentrates in PCP, well, clearly you will increase the infectious uh, safety. I don't see that we, I don't see why it will impact on the risk of immunity development that will certainly increase the convenience. Clearly, you need to know that there is a lot of scientific validation of recombinant products, the cost that has to be uh, agreed locally, and you need to know that the future of uh, hemophilia is certainly long acting. Uh, products and modified products to recombine. I don't think there is a major future for uh, plasma derived, except if this is the only option which is available in your country. There have been several studies looking at the risk of limited development when switching from plasma to recombinant, from, from one recombinant to another. I don't have much time to go into the details, but you can trust me. In this experience from Canada, no inhibitor when switching and also the Irish experience, there was no inhibited development when patients, patients were switched from one product to another. So clearly, when you are dealing with patients that have already been massive, massively exposed to factor eight or intensively exposed, I don't see why you should hear this kind of competition. And this is also the case in the UK with a specific uh, uh, publication from the facto, uh, clearly showing that when switching from full length of common factor to waste factor, there was no increased risk of inhibitor development. So important data for you as well as myself. So uh, you need to know that uh, the recombinant products really offer major advantages. Certainly uh, many of them have what we call the needle-free reconstitution device. The infusion volume is very small. They can be kept at ambient temperature for many of them, prolonged shelf life, and you can also, in most countries, advise of different types. Uh, for many of these products, long formulations have been developed. If they are accessible, that could improve the management of your patients, but uh, really the priority should be given to promoting access to recombinant. This is the first step, and a modified factory molecule to recombinant technology is certainly the future. So clearly, when selecting a specific factory concentrate, you need to take into account the efficacy, the safety, and multiple other factors that are summarized on this slide. And uh, I have to tell you that in my center in Brussels, 99% of all patients are on the recombinant cost. As you know, we now have all treatment options, and one of the treatment options is the big specific antibody, and um, and Libra produced by Roche, I will share with you a few words about this agent. So this is not factor eight, this is an antibody, a big specific antibody that binds to factor nine on one side and factor 10 on the other side. 
uh, mimicking the actions of factories. Clearly, these patients are treated differently. They will not have peace and trust. After a loading phase, they will have a space. So uh, it's totally different from uh, factories. So here, I'm summarizing the key features of Amy. It's a big specific antibody. It's given subcut. It has a prolonged effect. It can be given to patients with an inhibitor. And high frequency has been found in uh, the studies published so far. However, there have been cases of thrombosis, including one death in patients who received together emicizumab and FIBA, an association that is uh, totally prohibited today. So, what are the strengths? It, it can be given subcut, it can be given to the inhibitor patient, it has a long half life, it gives a steady protection, and uh, it will also result in a much more homogeneous and predictable treatment regimen for most patients. Is there a place for factor VIII? Uh, considering the success uh, in some places of emicizumab, you should not minimize the fact that factor VIII is flexible. Uh, when you treat with factor VIII, you have the ability, you keep the ability to control the factor VIII efficiency, you can adjust the peak, you can measure it, you can predict the levels. Uh, there is a high potential for individualization. Uh, it's a monotherapy. The problem is that when patients are treated with any, they might still need factor VIII. Uh, you can self-manage invasive procedure, and patients, many patients might still prefer IV treatment with factor VIII that they know and they trust. And this I summarize quickly the weaknesses of IMI, no flexibility, it's rigid, it's not a monotherapy with IMI factor eight, and that's why factor eight really is important. There is limited place for individualization. There is no ability to correct factor eight in the normal range, except by giving additional factor eight, and there is need for surgery. And if there is need, there is a need for factor eight in case of surgery or trauma. So I would like to conclude now. Um, I've tried to convince you that recurrent factor VIII incidentally replacement therapy of choice for patients with hemophilia A for several reasons. It's also true for patients with hemophilia B. If you have access to recombinant lines, modalities of switching have been defined to be followed. In PTPs, there is no increased risk of inhibitor when switching from plasma factor VIII to recombinant A, and emicizumab represents an alternative treatment with factor VIII in patients with severe hemophilia A but it has some limitations and the modalities of use should be carefully considered. I stop here and I thank you for your attention.